Just wanted to update you regarding my dad. Thank you for asking many of you, and thank you for your prayers. So he's at home now. He's doing much better. Um, he still has to wear a neck brace, I think, for eight weeks. So please keep him and my mom in your prayers. She's the one looking after him. I just wanted to mention also that we are back to our regular schedule. The very first day when we opened was a Wednesday. So we added that morning mass, but that was just for that day. So people kill, still keep asking me, are we going to have morning mass on Wednesday? No, we are back to our regular schedule. So on Wednesday, tomorrow, mass will be at 7.30. However, we record the homilies just for people who are at home who are not able to come out or perhaps shouldn't come out to, to weekday mass. So usually I will, for Wednesday, I will try to pre-record the homily and so it will be available earlier in the day. So just because you see the homily doesn't mean we had morning mass. In regards to today's reading, I just wanted to comment a little bit on, on today's first reading. Um, it says that God will punish uh, the Jewish people, the Israelites, because of their unfaithfulness. It, it actually states, I will punish you for all your iniquity. And I have been mentioning that often when we experience suffering, it's not necessarily because of our own sin. Sometimes it is. So I gave the example of someone who drinks excessively and then the next day they have a hangover, a terrible headache. Well, that's the kind of punishment that you bring upon yourself for your own sins. Now, usually we do it to ourselves. So when we separate ourselves from God, when we offend God, just we deprive ourselves of God's protective powers, His protective graces, so bad things are more likely to happen. But we can make the argument that sometimes God may purposely allow something bad to happen to someone in order to teach them that what they are doing is not good. Think, for example, of sexually transmitted diseases. So in recent times, because more and more young people are being sexually promiscuous, even married couples, there has been an increase in sexually transmitted infections or diseases, and not only an increase, but there's newer types of sexually transmitted infections. So God, or God is using nature to try to teach people you shouldn't be sleeping around. Try to be faithful to your spouse. Not try, but be faithful to your spouse, and, and wait until marriage to have sexual relations, because if you don't, you're just gonna bring misery Yourselves. So yes, it is true, sometimes God does allow bad things to happen to teach us, to get us to change our ways. So every time something bad happens to us, we recall that I was trying to say this past weekend that suffering is a part of life, and if we have the right attitude, it can be used to our advantage. We can draw down God's graces for ourselves. If we unite our sufferings with those of our Lord, we can atone for our past sins. We can obtain the um, draw down basis for the conversion of our loved ones. So suffering is actually something very valuable from the Christian perspective, provided we have the right attitude. In regards to today's gospel reading, I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Our Lord is asleep in the boat. There's a terrible storm that comes, and eventually the Apostles wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? And all of a sudden, our Lord just says, stop, and the wind and the sea stop. The huge waves all of a sudden stop. Now, the lake, uh, this is probably uh, Lake uh, Galilee, uh, it goes by different names also, but it's quite a large lake. It's huge. So imagine big waves, and all of a sudden, they just completely stop. So just goes to show the power of our Lord. God can do all things. But it is nevertheless quite impressive, even the apostles themselves. What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? You know, sometimes when I was younger and I read this passage, I was thinking, how could someone be asleep in a boat when there's this huge storm and wind and all these things happen? Well, the answer is quite easy to, to uh, uh, arrive at. So in the bow of the boat, which is the front of the boat, so if you're in the center of the boat, I had actually been to Galilee, and they took us out on, onto the Sea of Galilee, and it was quite a large boat. So 
so often we think of small boats, sometimes in movies about it, where they show these very small boats, but no, they were fairly large, you know, they could easily accommodate like 30 people on it, so uh, fairly large. So it's, there's only speculation in regards to the actual size of what it was, but nevertheless, on this boat, if you're near the edge of the boat, and if the boat is kind of rocking like this, but the best part to be in the boat is in the center. So when you're in the center, while the outside part is, you know, a lot of motion, in the center is it's fairly, it's just a slight rocking. So over here you can see it's just a slight rocking. So it's kind of like rocking someone to sleep. So if our Lord was in the bow of the boat, that's the front part, he would have also been under the part that's covered. So he would not have felt the wind or if there was any way splashing, he would have not noticed any of that. He was on a cushion, as I mentioned in one of the other uh, gospel passages. Plus, our Lord was very tired. He was constantly dealing with people all day long. He often spent entire nights in prayer, so he was tired. But recall that he is God. And he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew there would be this storm. And he wanted to allow it to happen. So he allows himself to fall asleep. And perhaps he purposely stays asleep also. But imagine also the apostles, they were fishermen. They were expert fishermen. They knew the sea, they knew how to handle the storm, so they were very self-confident. And what's interesting is the Sea of Galilee it would often have um, flash storms, in other words, storms that come out of nowhere. And the reason for this is there were some um, mountains or higher area, and when a cold front came, the cold air would very quickly rush down the mountain and onto the sea and stir up the waves and then cause these terrible storms. So in this case, the storm is so severe that the apostles, these expert fishermen, are just not able to handle the situation. The boat is probably getting flooded with water and they're trying to bail it out. And eventually, in desperation, they're seeking our Lord's assistance, Lord, come and help us bail out the water or whatever. So they wake him up, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? And notice what he says, O oh, you of little faith, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Trust in God, no matter what happens. Yes, do what you need to do, but always trust in God. So our Lord rebukes the winds and the sea, and there's dead silence. The sea is calm. All those huge waves all of a sudden just disappear. All the wind just disappears. So what was our Lord trying to teach them by means of this miracle that he performed by means of this storm? He's trying to teach them that, look, you're going to have storms in your life. But if you give in to despair, if you give up hope, you are doomed. You are lost. So never give up hope. Always trust in God. God is there. He's not asleep. Even though he might appear to be asleep. In other words, you think, where is God in my life? I'm experiencing so much suffering. God is there. He knows what is happening to you. And he's giving you the grace to help you to deal with that. But you must open yourself up to him. You must trust in him. You must pray to him. You must, in a sense, wake him from his slumber if, if he were to be asleep. But of course, God doesn't sleep. So we can use this to, to apply it to ourselves, to our own lives, the difficulties, the storms that we experience in our own lives. But we can also use it to apply to the church. So in other words, this ship or this boat symbolizes the church. And when we look at the history of the church, there were times when the waves were so rocky, it seemed like the, the ship, the church was just going to go under. There was so much corruption in the church, so much opposition to the church seemed that it was going to go under. But it didn't. Our Lord kind of brought the church back, usually by means of saints. So think, for example, of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. I can't remember how many millions left the church and became Protestants. It's interesting to note that at that very same time, in Mexico, in Guadalupe, our lady was appearing to Juan Diego, and millions of people converted to the faith in Mexico. So God kind of counterbalance what was happening in, in Europe. But many people uh, abandoned ship at that time, and yet God reached up some of the greatest saints in the 
hundreds during the decline of the Protestant Revolution. St. Teresa of Alba, St. John of the Cross, St. Philip Neri, St. Robert Bellarmine, and St. Ignatius of Loyola, and we can go on and on and on. So all these great saints, they, they kind of stayed within the church, and from within the church they brought about reform and that desire for personal sanctity, which led many Catholics to take their faith more seriously. So no matter what storm the church we have to face, in the end, God will help us. So we have to trust in God. We never give in to despair. We never jump ship. So was, uh, you know, with the scandals not that long ago, the priest scandal, some people said, oh, I'm going to leave the church. It's kind of like they're putting their faith in priests instead of in God. So yes, there are many bad priests, but it's a small percentage of the many good priests that are present. And as I said before, if, if you're going to judge the church based on a few bad priests, why don't you judge the church based on the example of the saints who are truly living the life of a Catholic, what it means to be a Catholic? People like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, or St. Francis of Assisi, or Padre Pio. Why don't you judge the church by means of these types of individuals? But they don't follow my logic. Today we celebrate the feast of the first martyrs of Rome. And they're not really the first martyrs of Rome, but they're the first ones that were when, when the big persecution really started. So even prior to this event, which occurred in around the year 64, what happened is there was a fire that was started in Rome, and the fire raged for, for quite a long time and destroyed much of, of the Roman buildings. And it was rumored and believed by historians and people who, who were in the know that this was most likely caused by Emperor Nero, who was the emperor of Rome at that time. And he wanted to redesign Rome. He wanted to build new buildings. And he thought, well, why not start a fire? And, you know, it, it, we can just say it happened by accident. But eventually, he put the blame on the Christians. So it's believed that Nero started this fire and he put the blame on the Christians. And it's interesting, you know, we talk today about false news, you know, in the media. So that was the false news of the false media back then. The Christians who were innocent were being blamed for this fire. Now imagine the Romans, they were very upset. They, a lot of them lost their homes, their businesses, their possessions, whatever, their lifestyle. So a lot of them were very upset and they wanted to put the blame on someone. And when Nero said it was the Christians, there was this united effort to round up the Christians and to make them pay for this. And so Nero, you know, started the, the, the torture of the Christians and the, and the, and the, the uh, having the Christians go into the Colosseum and, and letting the, the wild animals out and, and all these things to, to entertain the people which further fuel the desire of people to, yes, we want to see them suffer because they are the ones who caused this horrible fire that destroyed so much of Rome. And it's recorded historically that uh, Emperor Nero, what he also did in his, own, in his own palace, he would take these Christians and he would have them covered in tar. And as you know, tar is flammable. So they were covered in tar and he would light them on fire during the nighttime, and so this was illumination and entertainment. These Christians who were screaming in agony and pain, but nevertheless they were providing light, or they were the lamps lighting up the nighttime. So, you know, when we consider today's gospel reading, and there's this storm, and the Lord is, is asleep, and they wake him up, and don't you care that we are perishing? Imagine what those early Christians were thinking. Where is our Lord? Why isn't our Lord helping us? We're enduring this storm of persecution. We are being martyred. We are being tortured. We are being set aflame. Where is our Lord? Our Lord was aware of their sufferings. And I, as I mentioned before regarding St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, God strengthened them in their suffering. So yes, prior to this event, there was persecution of Christians, but not to this extent. And starting with Nero, the persecution of Christians continued up until the year 300. Just in 
early 300s, like 306 or something like that. I can't remember the exact date. And it is true that some of the emperors or rulers were a little bit more lenient at times, but every now and then there would be a, a renewed severe persecution of the Christians. So for 300 years, roughly, these Christians were severely persecuted and killed, martyred for the faith. Where was God in all of this? He was there. As I mentioned, he was strengthening them, he was consoling them, he was giving them the graces that they need to face this difficulty. But in the end, yes, the church was renewed, or the church was given the freedom to practice its faithful beliefs was by Emperor Constantine. And it was the, um, the uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it, it happened like 306 or 309, I can't remember the exact date. So he made Christianity an official, acceptable religion. He also forbade crucifixions, because up until that time, crucifixions continued to take place. Many Christians were also crucified. So our Lord was there, but our Lord used this suffering to manifest the great courage of the early Christians. And in fact, it's interesting, Constantine, his mother, Emperor Constantine, his mother was Saint Helena. And she was married to Constantine's father, who, who was a Roman uh, pagan, and he was a, a military man. And when we read about the life of Emperor Constantine, it mentions that his father had related to him how much these Roman soldiers who were extremely brave and strong, how they marveled at the courage of these Christians who had to face the wild animals or the tortures, and these noble Roman soldiers were so impressed by the courage and strength of these Christians in the face of sufferings that they really esteemed these Christians. And that, as well as the influence of his mother, St. Helena, led eventually to um, uh, Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity and to making Christianity an official accepted of religion. Recall how our Lord, or it is pointed out by various saints, um, I can't remember what we're saying, it was that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. So by dying in this fashion, by embracing their sufferings, uniting their sufferings with our Lord, they drew down an abundance of God's graces upon the entire world, which led to further conversions and eventually allowing Christianity to become an official, acceptable religion. So, no matter how long a period we may have to suffer, God has not abandoned us, even though we may appear to be sleeping. Now, part of the reason that I really emphasize this is because near the end times, this is what's going to happen. Faith is going to get watered down, the influence of the world will become greater, and eventually there will be persecution of Christians. Catholics will be taken to prison, they will be imprisoned, They're, they will lose their possessions, they may even be martyred. And are we going to persevere? Or are we going to be like those who jump ship? So, no matter what happens, no matter what storm we have to face, whether it's as the church as a whole or as individuals, we always need to trust in God. He never abandons us. He isn't ever really asleep. Thanks,